Now, this is Jim Tucker, who's an old, old friend of mine, and he's got lots of academic... Uh, well, give, tell us some of your academic uh, qualifications, please. Well, I'm a medical doctor, I'm a physician, oh. and I'm a board-certified child psychiatrist. I am the director of the Division of Perceptual Studies, and I'm also the Bonner Lowry Professor of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences at the University of Virginia. So shut up and listen to him, all right? <laughs> <laughs> now, I want to talk to you because you know about as much about uh, reincarnation as anyone mm -hmm. on the planet, I think. Um, start off by telling me about Ian Stevenson and then why you got interested in yeah. it. Yeah, so Ian Stevenson was the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry here, um, having a perfectly successful mainstream career when he got intrigued by reports of young children who said they remembered a past life. And these were from all over the world, and he went and investigated a number of them, got more and more intrigued, eventually stepped down as chairman of the department and focused full-time on this work. Um, looking mainly to see could the children's statements be verified mm -hmm. to confirm that the child actually did remember a past life. And um, he started this in the early 60s, and we've been going ever since, and, and now we've got over 2,500 cases. 2,500 yeah. cases. So what drew you to this? Well, I got intrigued by the question of life after death, uh, which is one that I think intrigues everyone to at least some well, extent. they ought to. <laughs> yes. Um, so the opportunity arose where I, I called here and, and volunteered to uh, give some time to help with their studies. And at that point, Ian Stevenson was in his late 70s and, and sort of unbeknownst to me, he was hoping somebody could carry on this work with reincarnation memories. Um, I actually called about near-death experiences to begin with, but then my niche sort of ended up being with the uh, reincarnation memories, and that's what I've been doing ever since. So are those 2,500 cases, what can you say about them that's sort of pretty hard scientific fact? Well, in the strongest cases, we have been able to verify that the children's statements match with a past life and one of a stranger that the child and the family knew nothing about before the child started making these statements. Um, so we never take anything at face value, um, but we determine as carefully as possible what exactly the child has said and, and then we go looking to see. Um, and how do you how find out what the child has said? You ask the parents, friends? Uh, yes, the parents and the friends, and sometimes the child, him or herself. Right. Some of them will talk to us, some won't. Uh, but we go sort of statement by statement and, and try to be clear about what the child has said. And then you go to the village where the original person was? Well, that's right. So we start by studying sort of the, side, the child side of the case, and then we go to the previous life side. And in the international cases, it might be to another village. Um, here, it might be to another state or, or another town or, mm -hmm. or by email with another family and, and try to see what we can find out. When I said village, because I tend to think of these things happening more in places where reincarnation yeah. is part of a religious faith, but you, yeah. you, you, you do get them from America. Yeah, I mean, certainly the cases are easier to find in places with a belief in reincarnation because people talk about them and then they're not uh, embarrassed hear about them. That's right. So, I mean, Ian Stevenson had associates in various countries who were on the lookout for cases. Um, now, with the internet, the cases, the American cases, find us. So we get emails from parents all the time uh, reporting oh. what their children are saying. So it's it's. Yeah, used to people would criticize Ian's work and say that it was just a cultural phenomenon. Uh -huh. And we now have proof that it's not just a cultural phenomenon because it happens here. Tell us one of the best, best research mm. cases, just to show yeah. what the possibilities yeah. are. Well, one that I studied was a uh, little boy um, named Ryan who started talking about a life in Hollywood when he was four years old, and, and he would beg and cry his uh, cry and beg his mother to take him to Hollywood. 
Um, Where so did he live? He was in Oklahoma. Uh -huh. So eventually she got some books out of the public library about Hollywood to try to help him kind of process this. And they were looking through one of them one day and they got to a picture from an old movie called Night After Night. And he pointed to one of the guys and said, hey mama, that's George, we did a picture together. And then he pointed to another person and said, and that's me, I found me. Now the first person he pointed to was George Raft, who was a, a well-known actor back Ooh, in the day. Famous, yeah. Uh, but the other one he pointed to that he said he had been was an extra with no lines in the movie. So Ryan's mom wrote to me to see if I could help figure out who this person was. Uh, and as we were working on it, she was sending me emails, sometimes on a daily basis, with all of these statements that Ryan was making, so we got documentation of everything he was saying. And then eventually, with the help of a Hollywood archivist, we were able to find out who this person was. This archivist went to the library of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, got all the materials on this movie night after night, and there was one shot that included him and gave his name. Uh, a guy named Marty Martin, and Ryan had described quite a life which, to be honest, I felt was unlikely for an extra with no lines in a movie, uh -huh. uh, but it fit Marty Martin's life. So Ryan said how he had danced in New York and Marty Martin danced on Broadway. Ryan said that he then went and worked in the movies, which Marty Martin did mostly working on dance in the movies. Mm -hmm. um, he said that he then uh, worked at an agency and Marty Martin started a successful talent agency. Um, he described this life of, of going to Europe on ships and so forth, which Marty Martin did. He also said that the street address of his house had the word rock or mount in it and Marty Martin lived on North Roxbury. And then also one time he said he didn't see why God would let you get to 61 and then come back again as a baby. <laughs> um, and Marty Martin's death certificate actually said he was 59. But when I looked into it, I found census records and marriage listings and passenger lists that all gave uh, ages, which meant, in fact, he was 61 when he died really? in 1959. So altogether, we were able to verify that over 50 of Ryan's statements matched Marty Martin's life. And Marty Martin was an obscure person who died in 1964, and then... So there was no information anywhere uh, uh, about him until you started no. to dig. Well, that's right, and, and, and now there is more on the internet because of this case, but wow. at the time, there was nothing on Marty Martin on the internet. So, what conclusion do you have? Well, what we can conclude from that case is that, most conservatively, we can say that Ryan had knowledge of this life in the past. Now, his experience of this knowledge was that it was memories of a life he experienced, and that's certainly the most straightforward explanation. Uh, but, but clearly we have very good evidence that, that he had knowledge of a life that it would have been impossible for him to have gained through some sort of ordinary means. Mm. Uh, so, so that's the kind of case that we are trying to explore. Can we rule out uh, that the knowledge that fits that there were no ordinary means where the child learned it and in a case like this? Well, there can be, be no sure ordinary that, means. No, absolutely There not. has to be some kind of psi explanation somewhere along the line. Uh, that's right. It, it certainly seems to be something um, psi or, or psychic, like you say, that, to, to explain it, because it, there's no uh, way to explain it away. Thank you. <laughs>